Hello, everyone, graduates, families, and friends. My name is Peter Bates, the interim dean of our school. It's my privilege to welcome you to the 129th commencement of the Tufts University School of Medicine. I speak for the entire faculty when I say how much and wonderful it is to have you all gathered, even virtually, to honor the achievements of our graduates and to celebrate with us as we award them degrees of Doctor of Medicine or the combined degrees of MD and Master of Public Health, MD and Master of Business Administration, or MD and Doctor of Philosophy. Those of you graduating today are a unique and accomplished class. You not only accomplish clinicians and scientists, you have engaged locally and globally in different ways during your time at Tufts, improving the health of our communities while acquiring the knowledge and skills of our profession. Some of you have partnered with community groups to provide patient care in our neighborhoods, and some have created and led your own organizations. In short, you are well prepared for the next step in your careers. You're not only a unique class, this is a unique time. We have learned so much during this once in a century pandemic and its revelation of deadly and devastating racism. Medicine as a profession continues to require in its practitioners a special blend of humanism and science. To me, it's a wonderful calling in life. As future physicians, you have shown your commitment to healing individual patients and helping to repair our world. There's nothing more important or more needed right now. Graduation is much like watching through a metaphorical doorway. You're leaving one life with its predictable rhythms behind for another with opportunity and unknowns. My wish for you is that you can find time in the next few weeks for celebration and to reflect with joy on what you have accomplished. Congratulations and thank you. Now, I'm pleased to announce the distinguished faculty members from the School of Medicine who have been granted emeritus status in recognition of their loyal and devoted service. These five individuals are Michael Jacob Barza, MD, Professor of Medicine Emeritus, Alan S. Copen, MD, Professor of Medicine Emeritus, Insup Choi, MD, Professor of Radiology Emeritus, Lee S. Perrin, MD, Clinical Associate Professor of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine Emeritus, and Michael S. Drapkin, MD, Professor of Medicine Emeritus. I'm also pleased to announce the recipient of the Dean's Medal that honors those who have demonstrated loyalty, generosity, and service to a particular school at Tufts University. This past week, our school presented this Dean's Medal to Deep Salem, MD, Professor of Medicine and former Sheldon M. Wilf, Chair of Medicine. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Spencer Scott, President of the Graduating Medical School class, who will give the class address. Hello, and good afternoon. Friends and family, administration, faculty, all of those joining us on our Twitch stream, and of course, my classmates, my friends, members of the graduating class of 2021. For those of you watching today who did not receive a weekly email from me for two full years of your life, my name might be a little less familiar to you, and so I should introduce myself. My name is Spencer Scott. I am 33 years old, uh, male. Uh, peers stated age, past medical history significant only for congenital hypothyroidism on levothyroxine, 150 micrograms QD, no other prescribed medication, vitals on presentation slightly tachycardic, sinus rhythm on exam appears somewhat anxious, some scant diaphoresis. Um, oh my gosh, wow, I'm sorry. I meant to introduce myself, I started presenting myself. For a second I was back on the wards presenting in front of my attending, I apologize, but, uh, but really I, I am Spencer. I seriously am a little tachycardic right now, but most importantly, I am the lucky person who has had the immense honor and privilege of serving this incredible group of aspiring physicians as their class president for the past four years. And as president, I have been given the cherished opportunity to address my classmates and all of those gathered here for our commencement. The opportunity to make this address to you all is one which I have looked forward to for some time now. For a few years in anticipation of this address, I have kept a notebook jotted with thoughts about experiences I've had, people I've met, or 
interesting ideas I've encountered in the course of our time here at Tufts that I thought might help me encapsulate the meaning of this journey we have taken together, or at the very least, could make you laugh. But when I looked back at what I had recorded, in light of all we have witnessed in the past year, it seemed insufficient, irrelevant. Even today, I feel torn between celebrating the jubilation and pride of this moment for my classmates, myself, and our loved ones, and at the same time, acknowledging the profound sadness of the larger context in which we arrive at this day. Of course, I am talking about the pandemic, the pervasive effects of which are plainly evident even here. As you can by this point tell, this ceremony does not look like the one we might have imagined as we looked forward to the day of our graduation. We are not sitting in a sunlit field in Medford, Massachusetts, and I'm not speaking to you from a podium, but rather this wobbly desk in my home in Maine. And to be totally honest, I feel a little bit silly sitting at my desk in this robe and cap, but this has been a taxing and emotionally draining year for all who lived through it. For many reasons, it has felt like the most traumatic year of our lifetimes. We have witnessed bitter political divide and an election, the results of which a large fraction of Americans claim not to believe. In horror, we watched a video of a black man brutally murdered by a police officer. And when civil unrest ensued, we watched a militarized police confront protesters, often with disturbingly violent results. We saw lines at food banks growing longer as billionaires' coffers grew deeper. For every one of us, simply adapting to the mechanics of navigating the pandemic has been exhausting. We have been deprived of so much of the social interaction that feeds us, that gives meaning to life. We miss seeing the faces of our colleagues, the smiles of our patients. And underlying those universal struggles is the most tragic story, the loss of life, the heartbreak endured by over half a million families here in the United States. When I reflect on the past year, the pandemic and events that occurred within its course seem to have laid bare, made more plain to see the inequities and injustices that deeply trouble our nation and even the profession into which we enter today. We see the effects of institutionalized racism and the disproportionately higher rates of COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths amongst racial and ethnic minority groups. Lack of access has driven lower rates of vaccinations in both Black and Hispanic communities, some of the very communities hardest hit by the pandemic. Even where there is access, how can we properly promote vaccine awareness and gain trust when medicine simply does not reflect these communities? For example, today, only 5% of US physicians are Black. So while it was inspiring to see the outpouring of support for the medical community through the early days of this pandemic, to watch clips of Americans across the country literally cheering on frontline workers, our future colleagues. It made it no less disheartening to be simultaneously confronted with the reality that our country, and by extension medicine, is flawed and in many cases failing those we endeavor to treat and protect, especially those made most vulnerable by the inherent injustices in our society. The past year has shown us all how many wrongs there are to be righted. And one can feel powerless, if not hopeless, in the face of such inequity and inadequacy. But right now, perhaps for the first time in a long time, I feel hopeful. I feel hopeful because this group of extraordinary individuals I have had both the joy and honor of calling my classmates for the past four years gains a power we did not have before. Today, we are granted the immense privilege of a medical doctorate, and we take our seat at the table and our stake in this profession. Yesterday, a fellow M21 reminded me of a James Baldwin quote I want to share with you. Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. This pandemic brought us face to face with the enormity of the work there is to be done to make meaningful change. Through the events of the past year, we have witnessed the deep rooted problems with more clarity than ever before. Having spent the last four years with them, I believe in the ability of this group, this class, this new generation of physicians to begin to write what has been wrong for so long. Now, I know that to lament a missed commencement ceremony, given all that we have witnessed in the past year, could seem selfish. But I want to give my classmates and myself permission to feel some frustration with what we have been denied, because this day is meant to represent four long years of incredibly difficult work. 
We have studied for countless hours, missed time with and obligations to family and friends. And I know that what our class misses is not the pomp and circumstance of rows of black robes and caps or a stage to strut across, but rather it is the missed chance to spend one more afternoon together to offer final hugs and goodbyes to our classmates alongside whom we have worked so hard and given so much of ourselves. It has actually been quite a long time since M21 has been together. In the waning hours of our time here at Tufts, I know we long to recreate those truly communal moments of our first and second years. The noisy interludes between lectures in the auditorium, the downright raucous energy at the beginning of a day in the anatomy lab, or the audible euphoria of M21 gathering in the halls of MedEd post-exam. I long for those moments because what we have shared is truly special. You have all made the past four years the greatest, most transformative, and most fun of my life. You have made me a better person, a harder worker, and I've been humbled and inspired by your ability and your drive. I will miss you, as I know we will all miss one another. And I cannot wait until one day, some years from now, we can gather again. I also have it on good authority that our five year will be at the four seasons. So get excited about that. In the meantime though, I'd like to leave you all with something. Every Sunday in our first two years together, I'd write an email to you called word to the herd. And I personally cherish the chance to try to make you laugh. And it's been a heavy year. So with your permission, I'd like to try to do that again. So if you'll indulge me, this is my final word to the herd. It's a story and it's a true one, I know, because it happened to me. So you all might remember, I used to live just north of Boston in a little town called Malden. And Malden has a beautiful public library I used to use as a study spot when I didn't feel like making the truck into our uh, Tufts library on the Orange Line. So one Sunday morning, I found myself at the Malden Public Library. I was studying infectious disease and using a resource we all know quite intimately. It's called Sketchy. But to give the unindoctrinated here some helpful context, Sketchy is a memory aid device that uses fanciful, often absurd cartoon imagery and distinct visual cues to teach memorization heavy topics like, for example, microbiology. And that day, I happen to be learning about adenovirus. You might remember the sketch. So as I'm watching the sketchy video about adenovirus, I look up and I see none other than U.S. Senator from Massachusetts, Edward Markey. And I'm kind of a news junkie. I worked at CNN for a number of years. I like to think I can recognize most US senators. And there was Senator Edward Markey, unmistakable. And I was pretty starstruck. I mean, there are only 100 of these people in the entire country. And here's one of them at the Malden Public Library. I'm also just kind of an Ed Markey fan. I, I enjoy his work. So I asked the lady at the library desk, I go, Senator Markey, and she's like, chill out. Come to find out, Senator Markey comes to the Malden Library every so often just to like, read the newspaper. And so there he is reading the Boston Globe, incredible. So I go back to studying, but every so often I'm keeping tabs on Senator Markey because I don't wanna bother Senator Markey, but I want to like give him a big smile or like some sort of recognition. And eventually I notice that Senator Markey has gotten up and, and he's about to leave and he's actually headed my way. So I sort of turn in my chair and I give him a big Malden smile and he smiles back at me. But then he looks at my computer screen and the smile sort of disappears from his face and he walks by rather briskly. Now, every medical student knows the perils of studying the at times graphic subject matter of medicine in a public place. I think we've all suddenly slammed shut a textbook on the train to avoid, you know, like getting arrested. So I turn back to my computer and I realized that this sketchy image for adenovirus features a visual cue for a particular complication, hemorrhagic cystitis or bleeding into the bladder. And that illustration is a statue of David with blood pouring out of his, let's say, groin to be polite. Now, in case you think I am being crude or exaggerating, I actually have the sketch right here. So here is David with a uh, river of blood pouring out from his groin. Um, and then there's also this child here uh, swimming in the blood. And that's to remind you that, of course, adenovirus can be transmitted through swimming pools. So to review, what US Senator Ed Markey saw to him was a 30 something year old adult man alone at a public library on a Sunday morning, watching cartoons of a very bizarre and grotesque nature, beaming at him for some unexplained reason. 
So Senator Markey, if you are out there, if you are somehow watching the broadcast, I am not a weird guy. I was just trying to become a doctor. And today, I am very happy to report that all of us in this incredible class of 2021 have finally done just that. So congratulations to the class of 2021. Thank you to our parents, to our families and significant others for your patience, to all of our patients, to our deans, to our incredible faculty and house staff, and all of the wonderful people at our Tufts affiliated hospitals who helped guide us along the way, especially when we were lost and just looking for the bathroom. Thank you all for the privilege of speaking today. That is my time. Spencer, thank you for your words and for your leadership in our school. It's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Pratesh Gandhi, today's keynote speaker. Dr. Gandhi currently serves as the Chief Medical Officer at the Department of Homeland Security, as appointed by President Biden in January of 2021. Dr. Gandhi is a triple jumbo, receiving his BA from Tufts University and both his MD and MPH degrees from Tufts University School of Medicine. He completed his residency in the combined internal medicine and pediatrics program at Tulane. And prior to his recent government appointment, Pratesh served as the Associate Chief Medical Officer and Director of Adult Medicine at the People's Community Clinic, an Austin, Texas-based health center which provides care to over 20,000 uninsured and medically underserved Texans, 70% of whom live under the federal poverty line. Over the course of his career, Dr. Gandhi has worked with working class and marginalized communities to address social determinants of health and poverty. He is a Fulbright Scholar, a Schweitzer Fellow, a National Health Service Corps Scholar, and he was named a Presidential Leadership Scholar in 2018. In his current role as Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Gandhi serves as a Principal Advisor to the DHS Secretary, the Assistant Secretary for the Countering of Weapons of Mass Destruction, the FEMA Administrator, and the DHS Senior Leadership on Medical and Public Health Issues Related to Natural Disasters, Border Health, Pandemic Response, Acts of Terrorism, and other man-made disasters. Dr. Gandhi is very clearly a busy man. Please join me in welcoming him to Tufts. Dean Bates, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you today, to the Board of Trustees, to the fellow commencement speakers across the university and to the leadership of the medical school, to the faculty and staff. I am so very deeply humbled to be here today with all of you, thank you. A special thank you to Dean Shah. It was only 15 years ago that Dean Shah and I were waking up early, meeting outside of our apartments in the South End, walking across the bridge over the Mass Pike, cramming biochem right before the exam. Uh, I really miss those times. Uh, and as I understand it, Dean Shah's in a uh, great position with you all at Tufts. Dean Shah has described you all as kind and as fighters for social justice. Now, I'm not quite sure that Dean Kulik would have described Dean Shah and I the same way, but we're going to roll with it. I'm going to expand on these two class traits of y'all's in just a second. But before we do anything, I want to honor you. You all have been on the front lines in the middle of a historic pandemic. I have been there with you, seeing patients in our federally qualified health center. But you all have been at the bedside, in clerkships, on rounds. And when everyone else leaves a room, you are there early in the morning getting that story. And undoubtedly, you all have seen difficult things. I wanna commend you for your resilience. These stories that you have heard from the patients that you have treated and been in fellowship with, will stay with you forever and will give you perspective on every other challenge that you face and there will be many more challenges in the years to come. This is part of your journey. You know, I, this process is difficult and there's a lot that I wanna talk about today, but I'll tell you that many years ago in the middle of residency, I found myself in a very difficult spot and 
very focused on the outcomes of whatever journey I was on. And I just couldn't look around and ground myself in the joy and the challenges of the now. And I had a, a colleague of mine, an attending actually, uh, who told me to look up this poem by C.P. Cavafy's called Ithaca. And so I know that many of y'all are watching on Zoom at home. If you have a second, Google that poem, Ithaca, keep it on the side uh, and take a look at it and, and read it. It will, I hope, bring you the same solace that it brought me over the last few years. I'm gonna tell you a couple of stories today uh, that I think speak to the traits of kindness and y'all being social justice fighters, uh, and then we'll move on. Back a couple of years ago in the summer of 2018, I was working as a physician and in leadership at, at People's Clinic. And as Dean Bates mentioned, we're a federally qualified health center in East Austin. We serve nearly 20,000 uninsured and underinsured Central Texans. And at that time, we were as a nation at the height of family separation, a policy that objectively harmed children. And I walk into my next room in the middle of clinic, and I see one of my patients in there. And she's well known to me. She is a DACA recipient, a nurse. And her husband is undocumented, works in construction, and both have been in this nation since they were very young. And they have three children, not much older than my three children. And as we're talking, she tells me that every single day she wakes up her three children early, before dawn, gets them out of bed, and her and her husband get together in a circle, hold hands, and say their prayers, because today, today may have been the day that her husband or her get deported. And she wanted her children to know that they love them. Being in fellowship with our patients, we are afforded these special opportunities, these windows into the lives of our patients, their own stories, their narratives, the narratives of their communities. And that was a particularly tough moment because her story was compounded with the stories that we were all hearing colleagues of mine, myself in our clinic, adolescents coming in to see us, afraid that their parents would be deported, parents worried, crying because they had to send their children to run errands and grocery shop on their behalf, afraid to ride public transportation. It was a difficult time. But even in the light of that policy, the zero tolerance policy, even in the light of recent national events, a pandemic, a reckoning on racism in America through the Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate movements, a national debate on who we really are, I am hopeful because I stand before you today as a son of immigrants, as a father of three brown children, as a physician for the uninsured and the undocumented, and I'm working for you, for the American people, for that patient of mine in 2018 and her family, as the chief medical officer of the Department of Homeland Security. Our secretary is a son of immigrants. I'm in this role today because I believe, I have to believe that you, me, the patients we treat, their families, neighborhoods, we all have an ability to make a difference in the world we live in. And if for whatever reason you find that you are blocked from making a difference, then make a plan to overcome that obstacle. Now look, I know you all are still fresh from seeing patients on your clerkships and I've all, often thought about how to take a rigorous approach to how we engage with issues around social justice. And I think of taking a soap note and many of you all have written soap notes ad nauseum over the last couple of years. So think of taking a soap note approach to these issues. S, the subjective, take that history, hear the story, listen. O, oh, the objective, do the analytics, collect facts, be open-minded and research. A, for assessment, perhaps the most important element, do not be afraid to put down in plain language what you are seeing. You can only call something shortness of breath for so long. I had an attending at Bay State and undoubtedly many of you all went to Bay State for your clerkships, Dr. Rothwell. And he told me at some point in my training that you've got to commit to a diagnosis. You just can't call this shortness of breath every single day when you're making your presentation. 
Is this atypical pneumonia? Is this COPD? Is this a PE? Similarly, when you seek institutional change, you can only gloss over the root cause for so long. You've got to name it. My patient isn't malnourished because for whatever reason, they don't have access to food. They're malnourished because of poverty and institutional racism, the lack of opportunity in education. You've got to say what you see and you've got to write down what you hear. You have to commit to it. P for plan. And I know you all know this, Twitter and Facebook aren't plans. Just like on the wards, you can't write a plan on paper. You need to rely on your team to execute it. You gotta go to the bedside. You need to go to the supply room. You need to talk to your teammates at the nursing station. Achieving social change is, is the same. You must spend time in the community you seek to serve. So take that soap note approach as you move on into social justice and institutional change. I want to tell a couple of stories as it relates to kindness, because kindness matters and it paves the way for policy change. Back when I was six years old, I met this woman, her name was Polly Gardner. My, my dad was working two jobs. My mother was driving across town to Houston, all to ensure that they could pay for me to go to speech therapy with Miss Polly. I am a person who stutters. And as a child and into adulthood, I often struggled with stringing together simple sentences without stuttering. And Miss Pauly, from the time I entered her office, welcomed me the same way. Hi, Prefesh. I'm so happy to see you today. How are you? She created an environment by her kindness where I could succeed. And multiple times a week for over a decade, I went to speech therapy and she was there, grounded my experience, built confidence in who I was, treated me with dignity. And yes, her training mattered, her techniques to engage in speech fluency, the way she taught me to break down my syllables, to remember to breathe, to monitor my rate of speech. She exercised all of her training to help me, but as a child, all I could remember, all I can remember now is just how kind she was. I know, because I've heard these stories from you all, that many of you all have spent time by the bedside with patients, many of whom had COVID, some of whom lost their lives. And in some situations, some of you have been in the room when they have passed away. You have held their hand and you exercised immense kindness in a moment of need. There is science behind this. Undoubtedly, you all know. The developing mind is resilient for children and for adults, but equally vulnerable to trauma. Adverse childhood experiences in childhood can lead to lifelong physical, mental, and social consequences. And experiencing these traumatic events from age zero to five is even worse, as that is a profound period of neurologic development. Yet we know that access to trusted adults during this time is protective. Kindness from adults can protect children from trauma. And these protective environments do not materialize from thin air. They must be created and nurtured. But building a protective environment doesn't stop with children. What many of you already know is that to be a good clinician, you've got to earn the trust of your patient. You need to understand their story. And that trust is built on a foundation of kindness. I remember a few years back, I had a patient who had severe back pain. And those first few visits spent a lot of time listening. And when you struggle, with a stutter like I had for so many years, you find that you can have entire conversations without having to say much at all. People want to be heard and seen, and if you shut your mouth long enough, it gives people a chance to tell their story. So this gentleman and I got to know each other, and he was a single dad and worked two jobs and woke up every morning early and woke his kids up early in the morning and put them in the school bus. And he ran his bus route, and then he dropped them off and went to a second job in construction and then back to pick up his kids and finish his afternoon route. And he went home and made dinner and then helped with homework and then stayed up late after putting the kids to bed to do all the other things it takes to run a home. And he's bone tired and he has diabetes and he's uninsured and he has severe back pain. And we're hearing this story over multiple visits. And at the end of the day, we had to get this man access to care, which we did. 
there was a bigger picture at, at play here, a bigger, bigger issue. He didn't have access to paid sick leave, struggled to take the time off to take care of himself, and therefore struggled to be able to take care of his family. And we know, and all of you here are scientists, you're physician scientists, we know that the evidence shows that we can avert millions of cases of illness. Let's take the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. Millions of those cases could have been averted if we had a national paid sick leave policy during that outbreak. Deaths would have been averted. The American Public Health Association talks at length about how children who are hospitalized would spend less time at the hospital if parents had access to paid sick leave, and adults are less likely to go to work sick. And for him, his story motivated our clinic, and our clinic became lead in fighting for a paid sick leave policy for the city. And ultimately, Austin became one of the first Southern cities in the United States to pass paid sick leave. But his story was uncovered because of the demonstration of kindness. So do not be afraid of the power that your kindness gives you. Use it for social good. Use it to create conditions where children can succeed. Use it to fight for policy that improves the lives of your adult patients and their families. Use it to be in fellowship with your elderly patients. Be kind, but please don't mistake kindness for a lack of action. You can be kind, but be absolutely ruthless in your quest to build a better world for your patients and their families. And when Dean Shaw talked about you all being kind, but also about you all being social justice warriors, these two things actually go hand in hand. You can fight for social justice by being kind and by using very simple tools but don't forget that that long-term change requires institutional reform. There is this quote from a Brazilian archbishop who famously said that when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. And when I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. It's uncomfortable to ask why. It makes people uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to ask why in the clinical setting, in a hospital setting, and certainly when you're looking at social and political determinants of health. But you've got to ask the hard questions. And you can't be afraid of simple solutions to really complicated problems. I remember uh, this was probably either right at the beginning of medical school, right before medical school, I found myself in India working. And there was this medical student, uh, I think either just finished medical school, school or was maybe perhaps in his last year of medical school. And he was working at the same nonprofit I was at. And he was trying to solve this issue of uh, medication non-adherence in the community. And I had in my head devised this very complicated solution to what was a, in my head, I thought to be a complicated issue. and he decided to take some time and observe, this was almost 20 years ago, take some time and observe and realized after a period of time working hand in hand with the community that the issue at hand wasn't non-adherence because people didn't wanna take their medication or had a whole host of other challenges. It was because literacy was a problem. And this young man worked with local community leaders to devise a very simple system they printed these pads, ink pads, the picture of the sun and a picture of a moon. Uh, and they used those stamps and put them on the envelopes when they would distribute medication. And seemingly overnight, the adherence changed. Assessed an issue, came up with a very elegant and simple solution, and then scaled it. So when I think about our approach to social justice, we can't be afraid of simplicity. We have to embrace it. And I took the lesson learned from that young man in medical school and applied it when I started this new role with the Biden administration. One of the very first things we did was make a list of all of the conditions that could cause adverse child health outcomes for those children in our care and custody. And for each of those 
variables, we outlined a series of interventions that can make a difference. And each intervention on its own perhaps looked a bit simplistic, ensuring adequate caloric intake for infants, increasing the number of medical professionals in our facilities, seeking input on trauma-informed care systems. But taken together, these initiatives are changing the way we engage in child welfare in our facilities. Simple interventions for complicated problems. But let's not lose sight of the big picture here. You've heard this quote before. I think this came out of an IHI conference many years ago. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So whether you're looking at food insecurity rates in Boston during COVID, and those numbers hit almost one in five children during the midst of the pandemic, or you're looking at poverty rates east of I-35 in Austin, which are significantly higher for black and brown children as compared west of I-35 for white children, or if you're looking at life expectancy by zip code, and you realize if you're in the middle of New Orleans in Lakeview, for example, and you go just a few miles east, life expectancy drops almost a couple of decades. All of this reaffirms my conviction that as physicians, by virtue of the thousands of stories we hear, we understand that the design of these systems is by far the most important element to ensuring healthy outcomes. Every system is designed to get the results that it gets. So we must have a hand in the architecture, in the design of our social, economic, and political institutions. And I would challenge you all to have a seat at that table. And when you get to that table where institutions are being designed, you better bring somebody from the community with you because there is a responsibility that we have with an MD behind our name. It's a responsibility we have by hearing the stories we have heard to make the kind of change, to make the change in design of institutions that leads to better outcomes. And we've got to bring people with us. So look, it is Sunday, May 23rd, and I'm sitting here talking to you all live after career working in the nonprofit space, uh, almost 15 years after graduating from medical school like you all today. And I am here asking you to help. We need you. Your country needs you. Your patients need you. Communities need you. We need your expertise and your experience, your humility, your ability to listen to stories, the privilege that comes with being in rooms with patients, then your ability to stitch those thousands of stories you will hear together to form narratives. So I ask for your help today. All of us do. You all have a great responsibility and whether it's the story of that DACA recipient that I knew back in the day, the bus driver who worked two jobs to make ends meet. You too have your own stories to write. And I hope that you use your kindness to fight for social good. You all be well, congratulations to the class of 2021. Congratulations to you all. Ritesh. Thank you. I think from your words, we now understand why Dr. or President Biden placed his confidence in you. We will now recognize the members of our graduating class. Dr. Amy Kulik, Dean of Student Affairs, will announce each student prior to their online spotlight. Thank you, Dean Bates, and thank you, Dr. Gandhi. We will now recognize the candidates who have earned the combined degree of Doctor of Medicine and Master of Business Administration. Dr. Sheena Desai. Dr. Jordan Ellis.
Dr. Alexandra Cushman. Dr. Christopher Muse Fisher. Dr. Claire Fiona Price. Dr. Michon Rambuquella. Dr. Karan Sethi. We will now recognize the candidates who have earned the combined degree of Doctor of Medicine and Master of Public Health. Dr. Riley Brazil. Dr. Taylor Dupre Burl. Dr. Melanie Chen. Dr. Angela Sarah Frankel. Dr. Courtney Elizabeth Hibbs. Dr. Sarah Boilo Corasani. Dr. Leanne Alicia Lewis. Dr. Emily Ann Miller. Dr. Christopher Michael Millman. Dr. Rachel Raindorf. Dr. Jeffrey Ryan Severino. Dr. Aminata Annie Samare.
Dr. Carly Taylor. Dr. Alexander James Topo. We will now recognize the candidates from the main track program who have earned the combined degree of Doctor of Medicine and Master of Public Health. Dr. Fies. Jasper Abu Jabber. Dr. Bridget Cecilia Olson. We will now recognize the candidates from the main track program who have earned the degree of Doctor of Medicine. Dr. Louisa Jacqueline Bauer. Dr. Andrew Beauchene. Dr. Campbell Roland Belial Haley. Dr. Rebecca Kruger Bell. Dr. Sarah Brockett. Dr. Adeline Haley Brown. Dr. Sarah Bunting. Dr. Corinne Carland. Dr. Brandon James Cushman. Dr. Elizabeth Groban Fishman. Dr. Alex Robert Jones.
Dr. Charm Karanasari. Dr. Austri Kempinen. Dr. Rachel Critchmar. Dr. Margaret Krutoff. Dr. Hannah Rose Martin. Dr. Asha Hassan Mahamood. Dr. Grace Noel Mueller. Dr. Lindsay Palmer Newton. Dr. William Olson. Dr. Jacqueline Aaron O'Sullivan. Dr. Julian Fausto Oviedo. Dr. Catherine Grace Potter. Dr. Sheila Savitha Rajan. Dr. Kent Reichel. Dr. Calvin Robbins. Dr. Jackie Royal. Dr. S. Spencer Scott the Fourth.
Dr. Christian Sleeper. Dr. Cassie Atlas Stanzler. Dr. Caitlin Ward. We will now recognize the candidates who have earned the degree of Doctor of Medicine. Dr. Aaron Amarde Wellington. Dr. Aaron Amarde Wellington. You can hood him. <laughs> Dr. Sarah Anstett. Dr. Dana Apcon. Dr. Diana Alexandra Aponte. Dr. Asha Ayub. Dr. Zachary Barbati. Dr. Joanna Barkas. Dr. Amelia Barnett. Dr. Vincent Battistini Olivieri. Dr. Owen Takashi Benyon. Dr. Elizabeth Ann Bergren. Dr. Shreya Bhatia.
Dr. Sotanya Bobajama. Dr. Ina Bodinaku. Dr. Robert Ryan Bradshaw. Dr. Jeffrey Michael Breton. Dr. Donald Royce Brown. Dr. Austin Bukla. Dr. Colleen Alice Cassidy. Dr. Sandra Maria Sapine. Dr. John Pierre Cherubin. Dr. Sydney Nicole Char. Dr. Justine Chang. Dr. Nina Chipolcutty. Dr. Richard Choi. Dr. Andrea Nicole Clapp.
Dr. Elizabeth Clayton. Dr. Andrew Cohen. Dr. William Daly. Dr. Jeremy Demeter Darling. Dr. Jonathan Irvin de Guzman. Dr. Elizabeth Manuela de Jesus. Dr. Serena Dada. Dr. Ista Egberto. Dr. Kareem El Tayeb. Dr. Zachary Ehrlichman. Dr. Adriana Laura Flores. Dr. John Breen Foley. Dr. Leah Fortson. Dr. Jasmine Y. Gale.
Dr. Thej Gunti. Dr. Candace Noel Gard. Dr. Gabriella Isabel Gaudier. Dr. Keith Matthew George. Dr. Tyler Catherine Glasby. Dr. Jonah Goldblatt. Dr. Yara Gurashi. Dr. Bradford Greaves. Dr. Samuel Kaplan Gretz. Dr. Nikhil Gupta. Dr. Robert Raymond Hall III. Dr. Sophia Halperin Goldstein. Dr. John Ryan Hanna. Dr. Elizabeth Haxton. Dr. Jean Sue He.
Dr. Austin Young Il Hong. Dr. Gabrielle Horner. Dr. Haley Elizabeth Huggins. Dr. Stephanie Sujung Yun. Dr. Nathaniel Onyuniechi Ibiziakov. Dr. Jolie Jean. Dr. Gabrielle Kamalani. Dr. Samuel Joseph Carmi. Dr. Danelle Kelly. Dr. Susan Kim. Dr. Saki Katadai. Dr. Lee Kowalski. Dr. Samantha Ravini Kumarasena. Dr. Xiying Nicole Lee. Dr. Grace Reyna Liu.
Dr. Emily Sarah Levine. Dr. Emma Livne. Dr. Giovanni Francisco Lucero. Dr. Xiong Wei Kevin Ma. Dr. Luba Margai. Dr. Lucas Fejera Marchins. Dr. Daniel Patrick Matamore. Dr. Don McGurl. Dr. Benjamin Mexis Faxon. Dr. Lori Ann Merker. Dr. Derek Metcalf. Dr. Elena Michaels. Dr. Anna Mikulowski. Dr. Greg Daniel Miller. Dr. Nathaniel Mizraki.
Dr. Amir Malai. Dr. Julia Moradian. Dr. Frank Morley. Dr. Esther Muradov. Dr. Joshua Michael Norris. Dr. Arama Obenda. Dr. Johannes Oster. Dr. Corey Pasacarnas. Dr. Andrea Pilota Goyce. Dr. Alexander Lewis Powell. Dr. William Manigold Quayle. Dr. Armin Allen Razavi. Dr. Sebastian Roque. Dr. Benjamin Rosenthal.
Dr. Shana Rose Rubenstein. Dr. Sabietta Suberwall. Dr. Rebecca Scharf. Dr. Julianne Shi. Dr. Joshua Skydell. Dr. Avneet Sowen. Dr. Nicholas Spittler. Dr. Richard Sun. Dr. Simon Takvorian. Dr. Susanna Talento. Dr. Idy Tam. Dr. Tung Tung. Dr. Abby Turlow. Dr. Laura Thibodeau. Dr. Alyssa 
Tatunjan. Dr. Jonathan Vulcan. Dr. Edwin Wong. Dr. Anne Elizabeth Whalen. Dr. Emma Nicole Winslow. Dr. Annie Wolf. Dr. Rafe Shu. Dr. Kyle Yamamoto. Dr. Matthew Richard Giannis. Dr. Aaron J. Yu. Dr. Christina Ewan. Dr. Anna Zhang. Dr. Lawrence Zhang. Dr. Helen Zitkowski. Dr. Natasha Catherine Ziv. We 
and will now recognize the candidates who have earned the combined degree of Doctor of Medicine and Doctor of Philosophy, Dr. David Alec Dixon. Dr. Craig Hanna. Dr. Jenny Bryn Koenig. Dr. Mary Elizabeth Moss. Dr. Frank Anthony Scangarello. Congratulations to the class of 2021. Now please stand by while we take a brief break for the class to gather virtually for the Hippocratic Oath. We'll see if we can improve upon last year's virtual version. Okay.
Will the recipients of the Doctor of Medicine degree, who can still stand, please rise where you are for the administration of the modern Hippocratic Oath. This oath was written by the late Dr. Louis Lasagna, Dean Emeritus of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences and Professor of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics at the School of Medicine. The oath will be led by Dr. Jeffrey Cooper, Associate Professor of Surgery and this year's faculty recipient of the Leonard Tao Humanism in Medicine Award. I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant. I will respect the hard won scientific gains. I will respect the hard won scientific gains of physicians who says I will. Of those physicians who says I will. Of those physicians who says I I will apply for the benefit of the sex. All measures which are required, all measures which are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. Avoiding I will remember that there is an art to medicine as well as science. I will remember, I will remember, remember that there is an art to medicine as well as science. And that warmth, sympathy, and understanding. And that warmth, sympathy, and understanding. May outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. May I wait? I will not be ashamed to say I know not. I will not be ashamed to say I know not. Nor will I fail to call in my colleagues. Nor will I fail to call in my colleagues. When, when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. When the, when the skills of I will respect the privacy of my patients. I will respect the privacy of my patients. For their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. For their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially must I tread with care in matters of life and death. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart or a cancerous growth. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart or a cancerous growth, but a sick human being. Whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. Whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. My responsibility include, includes these related problems. My responsibility includes these related problems. If I am to care adequately for the sick. If I am to care adequately for the sick. I will prevent disease whenever I can. I will prevent, I will prevent disease whenever I can. 
or prevention is preferable to cure. I will remember that I remain a member of society. I will remember that I remain a member of society. With special obligations to all my fellow human beings. With special obligations. Special obligations. Though sound of mind and body, Those as well as the infirm. As well as the infirm. If I do not violate this oath, may I enjoy life and art. If I do not respected while I live and remembered with affection thereafter. May I always act so as to preserve. The finest life. traditions of my calling. And may I long experience the joy and remember the affection. May I long of healing those who seek my help. May I always so as to seek my help. Congratulations. Congratulations. Welcome back, everybody. I don't know about you, but those hoodings are about the most memorable I've ever seen. The joy was palpable. And this concludes the medical school section of the 165th commencement of Tufts University. Thank you for joining us for this special event. We wanna congratulate all the graduates in the class of 2021. I'm now pleased to introduce Angela Rick, class of 2022, and her two siblings, Elena and Stephen, who will conclude our ceremony with a musical performance. Thank you, Angela. And thank you all for joining us to celebrate our graduates.
2021. Congratulations. Congratulations.